Thank you very much for your kind invitation to Khan. And um, at first glance, this uh, subject uh, looks uh, not that complicated as we we'll go along. Yeah, and hopefully, we'll realize how complicated it is actually is. I have no conflict of interest. And I think for the outline for my talk, um, I would um, focus on, I, I think it's important that we focus on anatomy and physiology. If we leave that, we will, we will run into trouble. I would briefly go into some historical highlights that I think is important and, some, and uh, point to the clinical practice today and future, some future uh, perspectives. I believe it is important to understand that clinical practice of today might be influenced by uh, Hippocrates uh, uh, writing 2004 years ago, where he says that the, mo the most deadly of all kinds of urine are the fatigued, watery, black and thick. And in adult men and women, the black is of all kinds of urine, the worst. And I think um, before we can go into the details of today, we simply have to look into anatomy and physiology. So, um, no all, not all of you are anesthetists, are you? So, just a quick, quick run through it, just to remind ourselves that some of the, on the sum of the basic anatomy and physiology, the nephron is anatomically located in the cortex and medulla of the kidney, and each kidney contains of approximately one million of these. Of interest is that now as the population grows older, um, we should notice that after the age of 40, we lose 10% of the functional nephrons every 10% every 10th year. And thanks to uh, adaptive uh, changes in the remaining nephrons, we, um, the remaining nephrons allow us to excrete proper amount of water, electrolytes and waste products uh, uh, throughout the life. Um, urinary excretion represents the sum of three renal processes, which is the Filtration, which is the filtration, the reabsorption to the peritubular capillaries and uh, secretion into the, tubular, into the tubulus and then urinary excretion. Uh, of the most, one, of the, one of the striking anatomically, uh, uh, what is specific for the, for the glomerulus is the fenestration of the endothelium. This fenestration, um, well, urine formation begins with this ultrafiltration and a large amount of fluids and uh, uh, with glomerular filtrate into the Bowman's uh, capsule. And the glomerular cap capillaries have a much higher rate of filtration than most other capillaries and this is due to the high driving pressure which is approximately 60 millimeters of mercury and a large capillary filtration coefficient KF which is the product of the permeability and filtering surface. The, the glomerular filtration is the product of the KF and the net filtration uh, uh, pressure. And um, in the deceased human, this pressure may vary widely, both to the disease itself, but also the net effect of the surgical trauma, our perioperative interventions, like IV fluid as administration of the medication, diuretics, etc., etc. To for substances to be reabsorbed, it must first, first be transported across the tubular, the tubular epithelial membrane and back into the inter uh, renal interstitial space and then through the peritubular capillary uh, back into the blood. Solutes are transported through the cells by um, passive diff diffusion or active transport between the cells uh, this happens by diffusion. Water is transported by osmosis, either through the cells or between the tubular cells. Transport of water and solutes back from the interstitial uh, space of uh, interstitial fluid into this tubular capillaries occurs by, um, by ultrafiltration and is driven by the hydrostatic pressure and on oncotic pressure. Uh, uh, 60%, in the proximal tubule, 65% of all the filtrate, filtrated sodium chloride, bicarbonate and potassium is, is reabsorbed and uh, essentially all the filtered glucose and amino acids uh, is the same. 
descending and ascending loop of Handel. Uh, is, the descending is highly permeable for, for water and moderately permeable for other solutes. And the thick ascending limb, 25% of all the filter sodium are, um, chloride are absorbed here. And um, when we move for, uh, further distal, uh, in the early distal tubule, the, the processes are very much the same. Uh, what is of interest is probably when we come down here, uh, where in the medullary, collect, uh, medullary collecting ducts, where we actu actively reabsorb sodium and secrete hydrogen. Um, and this area is also permeable for urea, which is reabsorbed here. Um, and the reabsorption of water is here controlled by the antidiuretic hormone. So what else, uh, so for, for to understand s the hormonal control of renal excretion, sodium and chloride is under the control of um, catecholamines, angiotensin II and aldosterone, and water reabsorption is under control of antidiuretic hormone. So what else do we need to know? Well, we need to know what's in the urine. And quantitatively, the dominating osmols in urine is urea, sodium, chloride, and potassium. And urine volume is dependent on the osmolar excretion and, osmolar, um, and the urine osmolality. U osmolar excretion is the sum of the osmols we produce by the metabolism. And urine osmolality is determined by the antidiuretic hormone. Accordingly, due to the equation here, the maximal concentration ability of the kidneys, which is the urine osmolality, dictates how much urine volume that must be excreted each day to excrete all the waste products of metabolism and the ions we ingest. So, uh, what else you did need to know is that the human kidney, the maximum concentrating ability we have is 1,200 milliosmoles per liter. So how much do I need to pee then? Well, human osmolar excretion is calculated to be around 8 to 10 milliosmoles per kilo per day. And if, if, you, if, if your intake is like the, the WHA recommendation, which is uh, a protein load of one gram per kilogram per day, that equals 400 millimoles of urea per day. And if you're having a Western diet, that should equal 400 millimoles per day uh, also. So we put that into equation, a 70 kilograms uh, uh, healthy well-being human should pee around 660 uh, milliliters a day. So uh, the integrated renal physiology is basically intake losses and the hormonal status of the patient. So how did that develop in the last century, for the last 100 years or so? I will take you to some quick slides. But I think it's extremely important to know the past. We we'll start with Frederick Koller, uh, professor of university, professor of surgery at the University of Michigan. And in 1936, his publication in, uh, in JAMA, he showed, his group showed that improved mobility and mortality uh, was caused by, in their material, caused by um, to, uh, avoiding avoiding pre-renal renal failure. And they did that by infusing fluids. However, he warned about the edema caused by these infusions. Later on in 1944, he, uh, he, 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 uh, he reminds us that many individuals are incapable of tolerating relative small excess of salt solutions during the immediate postoperative period, and he recommended dextrose solutions. In, uh, uh, in 1949, Lancet paper from, uh, from, that was from Edinburgh, Wilkinson and co-workers, they found, um, I would like to read it actually. During observations made for another purpose, it was noted that for six days immediately after partial gastrectomy, the excretion of chloride in the urine was much reduced below the amount found before operation and at a later period after operation. By combining observations of, on urinary sodium and chloride excretion with those of nitrogen balance, it has been found that the period of reduced chloride excretion coincides, coincides with one of reduced sodium excretion and often with the disturbance of protein metabolism, which Cutperson had called the catabolic phase. 
So, uh, uh, so what we have is that uh, a catabolic phase with uh, uh, nitrogen uh, with a neg negative nitrogen balance and urea load. Uh, Wilkinson 4950 uh, point to the fact that potassium is renally excreted in large quantities in the first 24 hours after surgery, and there is a reduced sodium and, and chloride excretion. And others like uh, Lequez and, and Lewis, Lewis postulated the same with a prom primary water retention in the first 24 hours, an early sodium retention, and a late sodium retention later on. And uh, in his um, uh, uh, and then we move to Francis Moore, uh, professor at Harvard, and in his studies, he uh, uh, in this um, in this uh, publication of um, sorry in his publications from uh, 1950 uh, 50, uh, his publication from 1953. It's a seminal paper where he identifies four phases, the adrenergic corticoid phase, the corticoid withdrawal phase, and the spontaneous anabolic phase. And what he says that four phases of convalescence seems to appear in distinct sequence in normal post-trauma metabolism, as we have seen in the study of our patients. And uh, we don't have time to go into the details, but what he pointed out that at the adrenic corticoid phase was a in, the patient had was went into an increased medullary activity with, increase, with tachycardia, increased peripheral vasoconstriction, hypoglycemia, they were in pain, they had a relative uh, oliguria, there was sodium conservation and potassium losses. And, um, uh, and so on and so on, and uh, we went into the corticoid withdrawal phase, which was a Contrast by brisk diuresis to compensate for the previous overloading, and then afterwards a spontaneous anabolic phase. Um, in uh, 1944, uh, Francis Moore's group follow up. The first author was Dudley, where they found uh, where they found a diminished excretory capacity for water. And then the, they say that this should be borne in mind in prescribing postoperative, warned actually, prescribing postoperative fluids. And postoperative patients should be expected to lose weight during the early phase after, in, after surgery. And maintenance or even increase of weight indicates water retention. Another professor from this time from Texas uh, he showed in a paper in 1961 that he demonstrated laboratory studies showing that the extracellular volume, uh, fluid volume, was, in, was, uh, uh, was decreased after surgical trauma because of internal redistribution, as he wrote, of fluids, and thus recommended that large quantities of IV fluid should be demonstrated to support the circulation. And his findings were later found, uh, unfortunately, his, his, his findings were later found to be uh, compromised by, medical, uh, by a met methodological error, and subsequent authors have later demonstrated uh, that the extracellular fluid are either unchanged or increased after, as a response to surgical trauma. However, and uh, 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 this is quite interesting, that um, prof another professor, Arch, his observation in Korea uh, made a significant contribution and change our practice, actually, because what they found was an increased survival in injured soldiers upon, um, upon the administration of large quantities of IV fluids. And um, this actually opened up, oh, despite the Americans' uh, experience in Vietnam with the post resuscitation pulmonary edema of the large quantities of Ringer's lactate, um, where they published in New England Journal of Medicine the, the paper called the post resuscitation wet lung syndrome. Despite these uh, data and reports, um, I think uh, Arts and Shire's publications opened up for a more liberal administration of IV fluids, even in patients undergoing elective surgery. Uh, so, clinical practice before year 2000, yes, indeed, concerns regarding preservation of urine output, maintenance of cardiac output, preoperative fluid deficits, the concerns about vasodilatory effects of regional anesthesia. Despite this, large quality, uh, quantities of IV fluids were prescribed, even in the absence of significant blood losses. And 
uh, 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 knowledge from the past were, well, not probably neglected, but seems to be, uh, you just continue to give excessive fluid. Uh, and some thought that it could be done in a safely way because it was excreted efficiently without any adverse consequences. So when we move into the 21st century, there was absolutely a new, renewed interest in exploring all aspects of perioperative care, including uh, IV fluid administration. And uh, perioperative fluid restrictive was shown to, uh, restrictive um, studies were shown to have improved outcome. And I think um, what, there are many examples, but um, one of the examples uh, is this elegant study from, from a flu on fluid restriction study, was published by Dilip Lobo, I think Dilip is here. Um, 2002, where they demonstrated earlier return of gastrointestinal function and uh, shorter length of stay in patients undergoing elective uh, colonic resection. And uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as Monty pointed out, uh, this paper from uh, uh, Birgitte Brandstrup is well known. That's an exa another example on, on, uh, from 2003, where restricted perioperative IV fluid reg reg regimen reduced complications after colorectal <laughs> resection. So, um, uh, I'm almost done. Um, I think that, um, um, obviously, uh, there's going to be a discussion afterwards, but obviously what we see in the last 10, 15 years is that we are moving more into a goal-directed therapy. We focus on rapidly correcting hypovolemia, we try to avoid, based on all these data, avoidance of fluid overload. And IV fluids and as active drugs must be used to optimize predefined proxies of tissue perfusions. And I'm sure you, you would like to discuss with me about uh, uh, global, uh, global uh, parameters like lactate, central venous saturation, stroke volume variation, caric index, and so forth. A future perspective, from in, in my mind, is that we have improved um, um, significantly in the intraoperative setting, and I think for the future we sh should focus more on the, the patient journey, the, 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 the look out of the uh, high dependent unit, and also to 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 really study how how should we monitor the patient, monitor the patient when they are out of the out of the theater. And, and uh, how should that be? Uh, how could that be co-directed and, and, and come up with evidence on based uh, uh, practice on how to handle this patient throughout the journey? So there is an advanced, uh, advanced, uh, advancing. Uh, our understanding is uh, uh, obviously has been advanced over the years, and uh, protocol should be in accordance to known physiological principles. And I will end my talk with. Uh, uh, this clever words from Jonathan Rhodes, that the subject of water and electrolyte balance has been obscured by a long series of efforts to establish shortcuts. It is not a simple subject, but rather one that requires careful study and thoughts. Thank you for listening.